the classroom. So, uh, the topic that, first of all, I'm thankful to HSC for inviting me here. And uh, the topic that I'll be talking about are uh, some of the measures which we need to take in order to ensure our recipients' safety. Compelled by their family members 
so there is a tendency to hide their own personal, uh, you know, deviations or uh, their personal history. So there is a risk of disease transmission always in these donors. Uh, another major consumers of blood are the thalassemic patients, road traffic accident patients, and those patients, females especially, undergoing perinatal hemorrhages or bleeding. Then, as I mentioned, there are serious hazards of transfusions, which I'll come to later on. Every day, new organisms are coming up. Uh, in the West, they are co constantly improving their testing facilities. It is not possible in our part of the region because of the cost factors. And last but not the least is the high cost because uh, you need to store the blood, you need to perform quality checks, you need to irradiate those blood products. Also, you need to go for specialized testing. And all these add on to the cost of a single unit of blood, whether it is axle, platelet, apheresis, again it is a costly procedure, or plasma. Okay, uh, I'm sure all of you must be aware of uh, what SHOT is. It's basically a serious hazard of transfusion uh, set up by in the UK where uh, different hospitals, uh, they submit any near misses or adverse reaction directly to this website and without naming anyone. So this is uh, in one sense good because, uh, you know, there's uh, this culture of hiding our own mistakes. That is important thing in transfusion practice is that we should be upfront to realize our mistakes so that we can learn from them. As you can see that th this shows that 81.3% uh, errors were detected which were all preventable. And uh, out of them 19 cases had ABO incompatibly blood transfused to the patient whereas majority of them were near misses. What is a near miss? Near miss is when there is an error, but it is uh, diverted before transfusion. We do not consider near misses in our routine practices, which should always be taken account for, because this is where we can learn about what is wrong with our system, and we can make a change. So what about our own practice? There are very few papers published where you can see that the incidence of adverse transfusion reactions is reported as 0.39% or 0.15%. This does not mean that we do not make any mistakes. This is a case of underreporting. So we should be upfront about uh, uh, reporting and documenting adverse reactions. This is very important. Alright, so we know that there are the six rights of blood transfusion, the right patient, the right staff, the right decision of uh, transfusing the component, the process should be right, approach should be right, and the system should be right. And all these factors, they ensure safe transfusion. Okay, so we have got two types of patients. One, where transfusions can be delayed. These are mainly those patients where, which are going to undergo elective surgeries. And then we have the other group where transfusion is imminent, where you have to go for blood transfusions. When transfusion is necessary, again, there are certain uh, steps which every blood bank ensures that the donor selection criteria should be strict uh, screening procedures should be in place and compatibility testing again should be optimal and we should monitor for adverse reaction. But when transfusion can be delayed, here uh, the term patient blood management comes into play. So what is patient blood management? It is basically an evidence-based multidisciplinary approach 
and the purpose is to make sure uh, quality care of the patient who may need a transfusion. And by uh, using this approach, we cannot stop all transfusions, but we can minimize transfusion. And in this way, we can minimize the risk associated with transfusions. So the three major pillars of trans, uh, patient blood management are, you can say that before undergoing any surgery, you need to assess the patient in order to optimize his uh, or her erythropoiesis. The second step is paraoperatively. During surgery, you need to ensure measures to prevent excessive blood loss. And the third is when the patient is in the ICU or post-operative care, where you need to take measures to ensure, again, that the loss is minimal and you need to keep the uh, cutoff for transfusion, which is, uh, you know, acceptable, universally acceptable. For hemoglobin, it is seven, except for cardiac patients. So, basically what we do is we manage anemias in patients undergoing um, surgeries and uh, it should be a patient-centered decision making. That is, informed consent is very important. They should know about the importance of transfusion and the risks involved with it. And then uh, interdisciplinary uh, blood conservation policies during surgeries, going for laparoscopic surgery instead of open surgeries, going for cryopreservation or uh, use of uh, cryo in order to minimize blood loss, and then optimizing coagulation. So what are the strategies for managing anemias? Ideally, for elective surgeries, patients should be referred to hematology OPD at least four weeks prior to surgery. I know it is not possible in uh, our setup because sometimes patients, they come from outstation, they have a limited time, they have no place to stay and then our hands are forced to admit them, transfuse them and go for surgery. But whenever possible, it is important that we should analyze them give them uh, supplements to increase their hemoglobin, those uh, like iron supplements, B12 supplements, folate supplements, and uh, also we can use IV iron and uh, along with uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents, that is apokine in uh, anemias of chronic disease. And the purpose is to optimize the hemoglobin prior to surgery. All right, informed patient consent is very important. Uh, it is not you take the signature of the patient just before, like any surgery, you need to get an informed consent sign. Similarly, for transfusions, you need to get an informed consent sign, but it should include all the disadvantages of and the risks involved with transfusion so that the patient can have an understanding and can opt for other measures. So this is basically generating awareness among the patients to decide for themselves. All right. So how can we optimize coagulation during surgeries? In cardiac surgeries, usually the um, hospitals where cardiac surgeries are performed, they use uh, tech or uh, rotum, these are the uh, real-time coagulation or hemostasis uh, tools which tell you uh, about the requirement of uh, clotting factors or the FFPs or platelets which a patient may need right at that time. So in this way we can minimize the, um, you know, for like cardiac surgery, you arrange six FFPs, you arrange six platelets, and then you transfuse them all at the same time. One another reason is that the patient insists that ji mera to blood arrange rakha hua hai, aap mujhe laga gaye. So, ek ye cheez bhi hai, so that also needs to be corrected. Then we should use uh, routinely use. Uh, Tonic acid, which has proved to be effective in certain uh, gynecological blood losses. 
And as I mentioned earlier, safe surgeries, intraoperative blood salvage machines are available. Um, I don't know whether they are available in Pakistan, but uh, in the test, these machines are available. And uh, uh, Another important thing is unnecessary testing of patients. We see that those patients who are admitted in ICU, their routine investing, a long list of tests are done on daily basis. And this can also give rise to anemia in certain cases. And this is known as ICU vampirism. So we need to be more judicious about the sampling as well. All right. So uh, I'm sure you know that uh, choosing wisely is an AABB um, uh, subsidy in which they tell you that do not transfuse more than one unit of blood when it is necessary. I remember when I joined my practice, the rule was that do not transfuse one unit of blood, always transfuse two units of blood. But that has not changed. Now they say just transfuse one unit. So we need to minimize our transfusion. Also, do not transfuse blood for those anemias which can be corrected through medicines. Also, for warfarin reversal, do not go for FFPs. Go for vitamin K replacement, especially if the patient is not bleeding. Again, serial blood counts, as I mentioned earlier, should not be transfused, and uh, O-negative blood should only be given to O-negative patient or female in childbearing age in emergency situations. All right. I'm sure this part is uh, known to everyone when transfusion is necessary. All right. So there are 10 steps in transfusion pathway, but the common steps where an error can be made are when you take sample from the patient at the bedside. You can miss the patient. Patient identification is important. When we perform cross-match and grouping in the blood bank, here again we can make a mistake. When the blood is issued, again, can be issued to the wrong patient. And when transfusion is about to begin. So these are three or four major steps where a potential transfusion mismatch or mishap can be prevented. Uh, another um, implementation of technique is major surgical, maximum surgical blood ordering uh, system. This is basically for elective surgeries. We know that for certain surgeries, certain amount of blood is needed. It should be written down in all Tashikara hospitals and everyone should be on the same page because sometimes you arrange unnecessary blood and your blood bank becomes engaged. So if that component is needed for another patient, it is not available. So uh, how can we make sure? We can make sure that this is implemented by ensuring that your cross match to transfusion ratio should be or equal to 2. So this is very important and it should be implemented and strictly regulated in hospital blood banks. And uh, as you can see, it has got multiple advantages. No. So before transfusing, you need to have a very robust uh, donor selection criteria form because that is the only way you can reject the donor at the first step. Most of the time donors, they are not aware of their diseases. So you need to ask them leading questions to make sure they do not suffer from any tra transfusion transmittable diseases uh, because uh, the tests that we perform are only for limited number of diseases. Another thing is the screening tests are not 100% safe because there's a window period when the patient donor is exposed but his antibodies are not made. Even sometimes the antigens are also not there. So although nucleic acid testing has been introduced which has significantly reduced the window periods for hepatitis B, C and HIV, Still, there is a margin of error in these cases. 
So uh, it is very important that a good uh, donor selection is performed and good screening tools are in place. Screening of blood component, sensitive serological screening is the hallmark. Okay. You should have a very good system of serological screening. And then those cases which are negative, serologically negative, then they are tested for nucleic acid testing. So uh, we do implement NAT testing in our hospital and uh, a combination of serology and NAT is the only effective way of minimizing these transfusion transmittable diseases. Uh, okay, last but not the least, this is uh, a publication which was uh, done, made by, uh, written by one of our resident. And uh, here we shared our experience of uh, nucleic acid testing um, in our hospital. And as you can say, see that it reduced the residual risk for hepatitis B by almost 50% and for HCV by almost 95%. If you look at the numbers, you may see that that detected 34 positive cases out of around 57,000. So this number is small, definitely small. It shows that our serological test is very good and robust, but still those 34 cases were detected and 34 families were saved from hepatitis B and C. So that does make a difference. So in the end, I would like to say uh, that uh, the patient should be prevented from unnecessary transfusion. Alternative should always be discussed with the patient and decisions should be taken not just on the hemoglobin level but on the clinical condition of the patient. Uh, review and implementation of MS BOSS should be done on a regular basis. Donor selection should be uh, very good go for voluntary blood donations and again in the end that along with good robust serological testing is important for minimizing transfusion transmittable diseases. So the way forward is to follow safety. S is for a safe culture of learning. We should learn from each other. We should not hide our mistakes. It should be a collective effort appropriate decision and timely provision of blood component. Again, it's very important, focus on the people. It's not just the patient, it is our staff as well, the doctors as well. Everyone's well-being is involved. Effective and clear, timely communication with the families, with the patient is important. Training and competency of the staff, again, are very important and we should say yes to safe systems, adequate resources, safety checks, and all those important factors needed to ensure safe transfusion. Thank you.